All right, we come on the air tonight with breaking news, live pictures of the Western Wall in Jerusalem, where it is now 2 a.m. The entire nation of Israel is bracing for a potential strike by Iran. It could set off a wider war in the Middle East. Defense Department officials tell News Nation that U.S. troops are on the move in the Middle East as a precaution. Ambassador John Bolton is with us momentarily, and we'll get to all things Middle East with him. Also tonight, live pictures of former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago Resort in Palm Beach, Florida. The president hosting the House Speaker and announcing new voting legislation that is sure to set off a firestorm in Congress. So thanks for joining us on a very busy Friday. I'm Elizabeth Pran, sitting in for Leland Vitter tonight. So first tonight, from the president, all hell will break loose. You heard me. That's former President Trump's prediction for what's going to happen after your weekend on Monday. He's referring, of course, to the start of his first criminal trial in Manhattan. It's just, uh, he did this just over an hour ago. He said he is willing to take the stand. I would testify, absolutely. It's a scam. It's a scam. That's not a trial. That's not a trial. That's a scam. If you read Jonathan Tarley, if you read Andy McCarthy, if you le- read the legal, they said there's not even a case there. That's election interference by the Biden administration. The former president is accused of covering up payments to a former porn star. You know the story. So she would keep quiet about an alleged affair. Of course, the former president denies ever having an affair. He says he didn't do anything wrong. Jury selection is set to begin on Monday. And trust me, it will be a circus. Trump made it clear earlier he believes the process will be unfair in Manhattan. So setting the stage. You know, jury selection is largely luck. It depends who you get. It's very unfair that I'm having a trial there. It's very unfair that we have this judge who hates Trump and has tremendous conflict, as you know, tremendous conflict. Nobody can believe that this judge isn't recusing himself. The conflict is at a level that nobody's ever seen before. So I have that and I have venue. We have all these things that we've asked for. They don't give us anything. It's a witch hunt that takes place in New York and that is taking place. And it's very bad for New York. Did you hear him there? He said luck at the beginning. It's pretty interesting to hear the former president use the word luck. Whether you support him, whether you love him, whether you hate him, he's arguably one of the luckiest men in history. So the word choice is striking. So as he prepares to stand trial for a saga that happened way before the 2016 election, today he spent time rehashing some of the grievances from the 2020 election. The former president hosted House Speaker Mike Johnson at his Mar-a-Lago Beach Resort. Now, the topic of discussion would be supposed voter fraud. So we're going to start tonight with Tim Murtaugh. He served as communications director for Trump's 2020 campaign. He does have a new book called Swing Hard in Case You Hit It, My Escape from Addiction and Shot at Redemption on the Trump campaign. So, Tim, of course, we're going to get to your book. I, ju- I just want to get your reaction today from the president with him, with, with the House Speaker down in Mar-a-Lago. How do you feel like it went today? Uh, Well, I mean, I think it went just exactly as former President Trump intended it to go. And and talking about the trial where jury selection is about to start on Monday, I mean, I think if you take this and then the other three legal actions that are going on against former President Trump, I think the first question that anyone, Republican, Democrat, Independent or otherwise, should ask themselves is, would any of these things be happening if Donald Trump were not running for president of the United States again? And I think the obvious answer is no, no, they wouldn't be happening. And then once you arrive at that conclusion, the only possible explanation is that all of this is political. I mean, you just you just talked about it yourself. You just mentioned it. The underlying actions here that are at issue in this New York case are alleged to have occurred in 2016 and 2017. That's seven years ago at the most recent. Why on earth would they choose right now? as the beginning of the 2024 campaign really ramps up to bring these charges and get these get this trial even started. It is all political. It's political from beginning to end. You have a DA who ran on getting Trump. That's what he promised he was going to do. You have a judge in the case who personally contributed to Joe Biden's campaign in 2020. And a lot of this case relies on the testimony of one, Michael Cohen, who is a perjurer and has an axe to grind against President Trump. Nothing that he says should be taken at face value. And Stormy Daniels, who signed an affidavit in 2018 saying that none of the underlying behavior that's at issue here in this case ever happened. 
it's it's political from start to finish, okay, and I, and I, I do, believe sir, that I even wanna, Democrats, I do, if they're honest with themselves, have to admit that. Okay, I do want to push you a little bit. Uh, I, we watched it today. Do you think he missed an opportunity? Because there was so much attention on Monday. But do voters want to hear about what's happening in Arizona? Do voters want to hear about the border? Do they want to hear about the economy? Do they want to hear about immigration? Do they want to hear about inflation? Did we focus enough about all the issues at hand? Were we way too focused on Monday? Uh, well, I mean, I think Monday, first of all, mon- this this trial was is the subject of the first segment of this show. The trial begins on Monday. Why why would things not be focused on that the last weekday before the trial begins on Monday? I mean, I think the president spends, uh, President Trump, that is, spends an awful lot of time talking about those other issues that are important to voters. I mean, you don't have to, you, you can spend time talking about other things at any given moment of the day. I think the way this campaign shapes up, I think, uh, is really, I think, very beneficial to President Trump because voters have had the opportunity to live through both presidencies. Everyone experienced the four years of the Trump presidency, and everyone has now experienced the four years of the Biden presidency. When you line these two, th- two presidencies up side by side, the Trump presidency, very successful, economy thriving, border secure, the world was at ease. Now you have Biden. The economy is in trouble. We just had inflation report a couple days ago. It's still red hot. Inflation is red hot. The border is Biden admits it himself is a chaos and he's looking around for someone to blame. Uh, The world is at war. The world is on fire in various places. Side by side, the Trump presidency wins. So uh, seven months out, you don't know what's going to happen. But if the election were today, I believe that Donald Trump would be elected president again. Well, and, and if you look at history, he doesn't do poorly, especially campaign wise, um, when he is undergoing some of these legal, I guess you could say there's a, a myriad of a myriad of cases, if you will. Right. And we won't go into all of them. I, I do want to talk to you a little bit about abortion this week. It's been a hot topic. I want to play a quick soundbite from uh, the president, the former president, about this issue and then ask you how it looks with the big decision that came down out of, out of Arizona. Here he is. What we did was give it back to the states, and now the states are working their way through it. And you're going, you're having some very, very beautiful harmony, to be honest with you. Beautiful harmony. Is that, is that a win this week out of Arizona? I guess it is a state's decision, but there was a lot of pushback from Arizona. Well, I don't, I'm not sure what the continuation, what he was going to get to. I think, I think he probably continued that thought after he said a beautiful harmony. But um, and I think that but I think the record on the issue of abortion is clear. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of the pro-life community for decades wanted Roe v. Wade to be struck down. Uh, it was and it was struck down by a majority conservative court that President Trump helped build. I think it's one of uh, the strong points of his candidacy as he's uh, attempting to uh, gather and rally conservatives behind his candidacy once again. Uh, and the fact is, it is now back in the hands of the states. Uh, and that's the way that, uh, that I think that is appropriately decided, because for decades, a lot of folks thought that Roe v. Wade was wrongly decided and that these decisions should be left in the hands of the states. And the president is saying, look, OK, that Supreme Court has ruled and that's what it is. It's going to be state by state as an issue. Those are just the facts on the ground. Yeah. OK, Tim, before I let you go, you know, some of our viewers may be tired of, of hearing about the president and hearing about campaign issues. And maybe they want to hear stories like the one that you have um, if I'm not mistaken, it, you've been sober for, is it more than two years now? Or it's four years sober, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. Can you tell me a little bit about your story? It's actually almost nine years sober. Uh, May 16th, 2015 oh, is my sober right. date. <laughs> Thank you. So, I, and I wrote this book. It's it's a political memoir, but it's unlike any political book I, I believe that uh, your viewers have ever read. It's half about my experience in politics and the 2020 campaign, of course, features heavily in that but the other half is my decades-long struggle with alcohol, and there's, that's me with my grandfather. I know you, you are in a baseball family now, and my, my grandfather was manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates yeah. for years, and that's where, I get, that's where I get the title, Swing Hard in Case You Hit It, which is a good philosophy for life, yeah. I, I think. I woke up in jail uh, one day in 2015 in Fairfax County, Virginia, and less than four years later, I was flying on Air Force One with President Trump. And, and this is a story about my long path back and all the troubles that I encountered. And it's not a how-to book, but I wrote it because I went to rehab five times. And I read a lot of books like this 
from, from people who went through the struggles that I was going through. And those books helped me. And I decided that if I ever wrote a book, I wanted to write one just like that, because if someone picks it up, and here it is, if someone picks it up uh, and flips through it for just about 10 minutes, and during that 10 minutes doesn't take a drink, then it was worth writing it. It's available now on Amazon. Yeah, and no, I love it. There was, the, there was the four. Yep. Okay, so that's where you can get it. Now I see where I got the four to jail. The jail to Air Force One, I think that was maybe what stuck in my brain there. Tim, I'm so grateful for you joining us uh, and, and, and able to answer some of those questions for the campaign. And congratulations, sir. Thank you. Sure thing. And I don't speak for the campaign. I'm speaking for myself, but I do, I do support President Trump in 2024. Wonderful. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. So let's talk about the president, the former president today. News Nation's Robert Sherman is live outside of Mar-a-Lago, where the former president and House Speaker announced new legislation that would ban non-citizens from voting. Robert, what can you tell us about today? Yeah, it was a Friday afternoon press conference that was slated here today, as you saw media from all of the major outlets coming down here. That was the premise for this press conference to focus on the unveiling of a bill to effectively try and halt non-citizens from voting in elections, although that is something that is already illegal at the federal level. But right off the bat, you saw the former president addressing the elephant in the room. Take a listen to this. Thank you very much. It's an honor to have you at Mar-a-Lago, my $18 million house on the ocean and the bay. And uh, it's one of the problems we have. We have a, a court system that's very corrupt. So that's all this whole conversation started today at this press conference was supposed to be focused on election integrity. The former president started talking about his case that is upcoming in New York. Jury selection takes place next week in New York, meaning this is effectively the last Friday that he has here at Mar-a-Lago before his schedule gets cluttered with all these court cases. But he didn't stop there. He also took time to go after the case in Georgia as well as the documents case from Mar-a-Lago. Listen here. We have Fawny in Atlanta, who's been so discredited and now. That was a setup with her boyfriend so they could take trips and take a lot of money out. And that's something that should be dismissed. Not just the prosecutor dismissed, the case should be dismissed. Every single one of them said, look at what happened with Biden. He gets off scot-free with 50 years of documents and classified information. He gets off scot-free. And I'm still fighting that trial. <laughs> There was a lot of chaos inside of that press briefing area here today. But I mean, through all of that, you saw some of the former president's strategy as he's really been trying to bring just about every issue back to immigration and the border, which his team believes is perhaps their best issue that they run on, whether it's crime, trying to bring it back to the border, whether it's election integrity, try and bring it back there as well. There's obviously a lot of passion going into next week. There's actually a gentleman just not too far away from us who's been uh, shouting at us for the last few minutes here. You've seen this throughout the afternoon in Mar-a-Lago. This is the kind of energy that's on the ground heading into next week. Elizabeth. No, and I understand, Robert, I, I'm so grateful that you're sort of persever persevering through all that. If I can quickly ask you a question, because we were able to watch it, but I know not everyone is, was able to watch the president this afternoon. Did you feel like there was a big effort to get back to some of those campaign issues that people care about, the immigration, uh, the border, all of those issues, inflation? Or do you feel like he was genuinely sort of going off on a tangent, speaking purely about what's ahead on Monday? It seemed as though that just about every crescendo that he had today came back to the issues, which is something that we've seen on the campaign trail over the last few weeks. Every topic, every question that was asked, it, it came back to the border. It came back to immigration. It came back to the issues on crime and things of that nature as well. So I mean, that was really the way that he was framing just about all these conversations that were taking place today with reporters. And it, it is clear. I mean, we've been at uh, ra rallies with the former president in Michigan and Wisconsin. These are the issues that he's been hammering there and which he will more than likely continue to do so, Elizabeth. All right, Robert Sherman, excellent reporting. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Coming up, what's the point of gun laws in cities across America if, well, we failed to enforce them? So if you look at Memphis, like other cities, cops and laws abiding citizens are paying the ultimate price. We have an officer down. We're starting from all precincts. They're en route. Damn. Where's the suspect at? Who went after him? 
And Israel on high alert. The terror threat from Iran is imminent. According to U.S. intelligence, can anything stop U.S. service men and women from being dragged into a widespread war? Welcome back. This next story is awful. Tragedy in Memphis today. A police officer was killed in a shootout with a suspect. Two other officers were also injured during the shootout. They were responding to a suspicious vehicle call when they approached the car, and the officers were met with gunfire. We have an officer down. We're starting from all precincts. They're en route. Damn. Where's the suspect at? Who went after him? The officer killed was Joseph McKinney. He joined the Memphis Police Department in 2020. The suspect who killed him was an 18-year-old black man. He had been arrested in March on a slew of felony charges, one including a gun charge. At the time of his arrest, he was in a stolen car with a gun that he had altered to make fully automatic. So basically, he was arrested with a machine gun. So just to remind you, he allegedly killed an innocent person today because he was out on bond. So if your line of thinking is right, despite those felony charges, he was out in the free world. So why was a man with those charges allowed back on the streets? It's not the first time that we've heard stories like this. Last month, police in Chicago encountered a shootout with a 26-year-old black man. They had pulled over his car. The man was inside. His name is Dexter Reed. You've probably heard the story. He fired at an officer, and police fired back multiple times killing him. According to court records, this happened while Reed was on a pretrial release for a pending felony gun charge. After the shooting, the mayor of Chicago paid tribute to the man who shot an officer. I know this footage is extremely painful and traumatic for many of our city's residents. It will be especially difficult for those of us living in communities where the events depicted occur all too often. I'm personally devastated to see yet another young black man lose his life during an interaction with the police. My heart breaks for the family of Dexter Reed. It almost is like no one's winning, right? So joining us is Jerry Green. She's a councilwoman in Memphis, the city where today's shooting left a police officer dead. This is a tough one, right? You are uh, at the, the helm of taxpayers' dollars, right? They answer to you. They press you. They look for answers. And yet we have a situation like this. How are you handling it? How are lawmakers handling it when, when taxpayers are saying, why was this man free? Uh, first, thank you for having me tonight. And I want to start by saying my uh, thoughts and prayers go out to Officer McKinney's wife and family and loved ones and his fellow officers at his precinct and the rest of MPD. Um, you're right. This is an incredibly tragic case. And we as elected officials and leaders need to do everything we can to make sure that we're holding every point in our system accountable. I think you've rightly pointed out that this seems to be an issue where an ROR, released on owner cognizance bond, was issued in a previous case that involved a car theft and a modified weapon. It is my understanding that the district attorney asked for that not to be lowered and the judicial commissioner overruled them. I think we need to be pressing on why things like this are happening I've always said, if you are brave enough to try to steal my car, you're brave enough to kill me. And unfortunately today, those facts were proven true. You know, does it go deeper than this? You know, you're, you're a woman who has authority, right? And, and how, do we ch how do we change the narrative here? We can talk about Chicago. We can talk about Memphis. You probably love Memphis. I know you've lived in the South for much of your life. It'd be hard for you to argue that Memphis is safer than it was 10 years ago. You know, um, this has been a really hard day as a lifelong Memphian. Um, I think most of Memphis's heart is breaking and we are in pain. We are experiencing um, an epidemic right now of crime and we have to go to solutions big and small. You know, we know that about 40% of our violent crime comes from guns that are stolen out of car. Cars in our state legislature overruled our police chief and our sheriff 
and instituted that law anyway. And so what I do in my day job as a policy advisor to the county mayor, I've instituted a free gun lock by mail program because if you're going to have your gun in your car, and that's fine, I understand if you want to feel safe, please lock it up, store it safely. I will mail you one if you live in all of Shelby County for free because I want to make sure that criminals don't get their hands on guns that should belong to lawful gun owners. Just be a responsible gun owner. We have to do programs like that. We you know, have to also go ahead. I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt you. We only have about a minute left as a mom, as a parent, when you look at, you look at 18 year old and its name is Jalen Lobley. And then you have, you, you look at the picture of the op. When you look at these two pictures, how does it make you feel as a mom? Are you mad? I am uh, sad. I am mad. I am at a loss for, you know, the officer was only 27 years old for these lives that were taken away from our community, especially this officer who was just trying to do his job that night and serve our community. Um, I am a mom. I have had my three children in the past year go on lockdown drills for active shooters in three different instances. We have to get a control over this problem. And we do have to talk to our youth, like the ones of the suspect who um, was also killed in this incident, and give them opportunities and um, pathways where they don't turn to a life of crime. It's going to be a long, hard road. There's no quick button to cure crime in our community. We've got to attack it from every angle we can because our children and our community are depending yeah. on it. I know, and, and you and I could talk at, for hours about maybe the, the family breakdown, but then you and I are talking about a 27-year-old, like you mentioned, Joseph Joseph McKinney is a, is a husband, so someone who, who was... <laughs> Thinking about starting a family. I mean, these are all these are all really, really hard topics, and we're grateful that you're joining us tonight to answer the tough questions. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. The Defense Department deploys more American assets to the Middle East as an Iranian attack on Israel appears in the U.S. intelligence. Well, they say imminent. So Ambassador John Bolton joins us on what America can do to prevent an attack. Back to breaking news, live pictures of Jerusalem, where all of Israel is on heightened alert for an Iranian attack. Defense Department officials tell us they're moving troops to the Middle East as a precaution. President Biden says he expects a strike to happen sooner rather than later. Speaking to reporters this afternoon, he offered a simple warning to the Ayatollah. Mr. President, to Iran in this moment. Don't. We are devoted to the defense of Israel. We will support Israel, we will defend, help defend Israel, and Iran will not succeed. We know the threat of a wider war is real. From Axios, Iran warns the U.S. to stay out of the fight with Israel or face attack on troops. They cite an administration official. This is a quotation, I'll have you. The Iranian message was, we will attack the forces that attack us. So don't F with us and we don't, won't F with you. That is a quote. Former U.N. Ambassador John Bolton knows the Iranians very well, probably more than he would like to. They actually put a $300,000 bounty on his head following the attack of Qasim Soleimani back in 2020. Bolton served as national security advisor under Trump. I'm just going to get it out of my system here. I remember it very well. 300 k does not seem fair. That's not the point of our conversation, but I want to be on the record that I know you're worth ambassador, and I think you're worth more than that. I do want to move on to well, the task at much. hand, the story at hand. We've... We have been talking about something that is not giggle-worthy, right? The possibility of an attack from Iran. We look back at the attack in Damascus. That was April 1st. We are now flirting with uh, April 13th. If you're looking at the time zones ahead of us, there has been nothing so far that is a stall. What does that tell you? Well, I think it uh, indicates that the leadership in Tehran may not uh, uh, have found an easy decision. I think they have to do something in response to this, or they risk losing sway over a number of terrorist groups who are going to say, Iran's not willing to put itself at risk. Why should we put uh, ourselves in that position if they won't? 
and I think on the other side, there are a lot of, uh, of uh, fanatics in Tehran who are arguing for a very, very heavy response on Israel. So I think this could be uh, provocation for Israel, really, to take it to the Iranians inside Iran. We've been in a wider war since October the 7th. The Hamas attack on Israel was not the beginning of a Palestinian-Israeli war. It was an Iranian war launched against Israel through a proxy terrorist group that Israel has been fighting since then. So this is, this is not something that couldn't have been predicted. It's Iran going against the little Satan Israel, and they know that the great Satan, the United States, will stand by Israel's side here. The this morning we woke up, there was uh, a stark warning by Christopher Ray, and then the fact that we were moving assets in the Middle East. Your gut reaction on both of those things today? Well, I think uh, both the uh, FBI Director Ray, who's, who's been doing a great job on the terrorism front and uh, dealing with China as well, uh, and, and the movement of military assets indicates that uh, through a variety of sources, we have very firm information that uh, Iran is getting ready for some kind of attack. Possibly we've seen their assets move or uh, we know of communications that indicate that. So uh, there's no doubt we're taking this seriously. We sent the commander of the Central Command to Israel to coordinate what Israel would do, depending on the nature of the attack, what we would do. Um, I, I don't know if it's going to come tonight. Uh, it's about three or four hours to dawn in the Middle East. You can never say for certain, but I do think the Iranians will attack at night. So we've got a few more hours until daylight breaks. Uh, it may not be Friday night our time. It may be Saturday night, but I do think it's coming soon. And when you hear the word from officials such as, as Director Ray, when you hear the words real and viable with those threats, I think the American people are kind of thinking, well, well, what could it be? You know, what, what, how could we be caught flat-footed? Where are we and where are folks in Israel the most vulnerable? Right. Well, I, I have no doubt that American troops all across the region are on a very, very heightened state of alert. The embassy in Jerusalem has advised uh, embassy employees and inferentially uh, all Americans really to, to stay close to home for the next couple of days. Uh, and I think that the, the real question is, will Iran act through one of its terrorist proxies? Will it unleash Hezbollah, for example, to rocket parts of Israel? Or will Iran launch an attack directly from its own home territory? And that, that's a big question. They've got a lot more assets there. Uh, but, but that's a risk that it will provoke Israel into a, a very, very uh, strong response. Because Israel looks at the potential of a nuclear Iran, which is getting very close, uh, as presenting Israel with the prospect of a nuclear holocaust. It only takes half a dozen nuclear weapons in a country, a small country the size of Israel, so when Israeli defense forces see planes that could carry nuclear weapons or missiles, you don't know what's, uh, what those planes are carrying or what's in the warheads of those missiles. Uh, I don't think Israel is going to tolerate it. I know the administration saying don't overreact when your country is, uh, its very existence is threatened. Uh, there's almost no such thing as an overreaction. So I think Israel is really getting ready. We'll see what the Iranians do, but whatever it is, uh, I'm confident that we and the Israelis will be prepared. All right. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us on this Friday night. I, could, I certainly have four or five more questions to ask you, but I, I know I have to respect the time that we have with you. So thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Glad to be with you. Coming up. A British movie director lectures Americans about democracy with a new film that paints a chilling picture of the United States. So why does Hollywood specialize in seeing the worst of us? 300 buys you a sandwich. We got ham or cheese? 300 Canadian. Okay. Adulthood. That's why vaccines matter so much. For 40 years, Rotary and partners have delivered vaccines globally. Like here, and even here, in your neighborhood and around the world, Rotary is ensuring children grow up safe from preventable diseases. Retirement can be scary, but only if you're not prepared. 
That's why AARP created thisispretirement.org. Because unless you've already retired, you're in pretirement and you still have time to plan. Learn about retirement savings options, potential tax breaks, and how you can build savings over time. Visit thisispretirement.org for free resources to help you customize your action plan and feel the retirement fear disappear. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Hollywood blockbuster certainly is garnering a ton of press. So we're sort of sitting back and wondering why, because the plot is a little bit depressing. It revolves around a divided America, a subject, well, basically every news writer in America has become an expert on. It's called A24. A24's fictional Civil War film brings a divided America to life, writes NBC News. Civil War Review, we have met the enemy and it is us. Again, writes the New York Times. Civil War Review, terrifying vision of a broken America, writes the Los Angeles Times. So if you're looking for maybe a lighthearted spring flick, you might want to look somewhere else. The film star Kristen Dunst had this to say about the film's vision of a divided America. I think that um, that that is also a symptom of the media and trying to drive division because really you know everybody's a human being with a story and I don't think that um, that that is a product of you know just someone growing up in their environment we could be wrong It feels like she's criticizing the media for dividing America, but she's also starring in a movie that is pretty dark. It portrays the end of America as we know it. Makes sense to you because it doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Just this week, we reported on new polling that shows Americans are not as divided as we say they are. In fact, Americans are in almost complete agreement on issues like the right to vote, equal protection under the law, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. So why is Hollywood trying to divide us? Victor Davis Hansen is a world-renowned renowned military historian. His new book is called The End of Everything, How Wars Descend into Annihilation. I'm so grateful that you're joining us, sir. You know, movies mm-hmm. are supposed to invoke emotion, and I understand that. But do you think that maybe we should be focusing on romantic comedies and not be getting into the political landscape of things when it comes to going to the box office? Yeah, I tend to agree. I think there's no accident that this movie is coming out right at the, at the beginning of the 2024 campaign season. And when they, I haven't seen the, plan, uh, the film, so I can't you know, be too objective, but the ones that I've seen in that genre, and there have been two or three of them, it's not just that there's a civil war. It's usually that a far right, unhinged, uh, white racist supremacists tend to be rural Southerners, sort of like the theme of this current book, Rural White Rage, that they are volatile and they're attacking sophisticated by coastal people who are reasonable and just. And I think that'll be, if I know Hollywood, it's sort of, as it's Hollywood is as ideologically diverse as NPR is. So right, and, and the the creator wrote in part that the film has to do with division, polarization, and extremism. And I wanted I, I want to bring that up because I think it marries to your point, and it marries to the timeline that we're seeing. And I want to weave in my question to you. We are speaking about it. it it's, a, it's a director, a wonderful director, a, you know, very awarded director, but it's, it's someone who do, it lives overseas. Yes. A, a good example of maybe understanding it is in 2021, the Pentagon said after the George Floyd killing and that, that woke hysteria that there was going to be a systematic hunt for white supremacists in the Pentagon. And they spent two years trying to find all of these mythical white supremacists and resi- uh, insurrectionists. And guess what? In December, they very meekly, timidly, and quietly said the, the report was here and had no media coverage, and they found nothing. But they did accomplish one thing. They did alienate the one demographic, white males, who died at double their numbers in the demographic. 75% of those killed in a- Afghanistan and Iraq uh, were white males who represent about 34% of the population. 
and they're now short 40,000 recruits. And most of that shortfall can be accounted from that demographic. So what I'm getting at is when Hollywood or the, or the Pentagon or, or established institutions keep hammering, there's an insurrection, there's a, a violent MAGA group, they're super MAGA, they're ultra MAGA, they're semi-fascist. All they're doing is alienating a group that they don't have any empirical evidence poses an existential threat. And so when you see Hollywood today, you know who the I, enemy I wanna, is always going to be. I want to interrupt you because, I, 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 and excuse me for interrupting you, but I, I want to put up a, a number of polls because it feels as if we are more united than we are divided. So that brings me to my question is, and we only have about 30 seconds left, sir, but why? Why are we, why are we trying to divide each other? Because I think our bi-coastal elites in the media, entertainment, Hollywood, the administrative state, they have a deep content for traditional rural red state America. And it's not, and the red state America poses no threat to them. In fact, they're an ecumenical community. I'm speaking to you from rural California, but yet I work in Stanford University, 200 miles away. And I can tell you, there's no talk out in rural California about a, a civil war. There's no hatred of people. They don't even know people exist. in the. But when I go to Stanford University campus, all I hear is MAGA, 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 semi-fascist, rural white supremacists. And so I think it's, it's a way of ginning up anger, and especially in an election year, especially in a candidate. I mean, they're, they're terrified of the return of Donald Trump. I'm not trying to suggest that would be good or bad, but they are terrified that somehow he will be elected. And I think this uh, Civil War movie will feed into that hysteria. Well, yeah, well, we'll see how it does. Victor Davis Hansen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, what, what a movie, thank right? Thank you. Appreciate yep. you. All right, Thank coming you. up, have you seen the calls for retirement this week? A slew of news outlets have been calling for Justice Sotomayor to retire ASAP. It's almost as if they know a Republican administration is coming up in November. Democrats appear to be losing faith in Joe Biden and his chances for re-election. I want to be careful with my wording here. I know our contributor, Chris Hahn, is eager to dispute that statement. But look at the calls for Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor to step down. These are just some of the breathless coverage headlines from our friends on the left at CNN, MSNBC, and NBC in just recent days. Some Democrats quietly wondering if Justice Sonia Sotomayor should step down to help ensure a progressive voice in her Supreme Court seat. The calls are growing among liberal commentators, advocates, and law professors for Justice Sotomayor to step down. They say it's not personal. They admire her work on the bench. It's that she's 69 years old. She is the oldest liberal on the court and a lifelong diabetic. And some are worried the stakes are too high. She is 69 years old. She does have diabetes, but otherwise she does seem fairly healthy. Right now, conservatives on the court hold a 6-3 majority. It was 5-4 when former Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. This is, as you know, when former President Trump was in office. Trump then appointed Justice Amy Comey Barrett. It widened the conservative lead. So it's a lesson that Democrats seem to be keen on preventing. Let's talk about it. Joining me now, associate research scholar and lecturer in politics and public affairs at Princeton University, Lauren Wright, and host of the Aggressive Progressive podcast and the syndicated Chris Hahn radio show, News Nation political contributor, Chris Hahn. All right, Chris, I do have to start with you because I feel like you're probably chomping at the bit here. Are you getting suspicious with all of these headlines? She is only 69 years old, and I feel like these are apples to oranges. We were talking about a supermajority scenario back then. This is different, is it not? What a way to end the week, talking about the imminent death of a beloved legal scholar who rose from New York City public schools to the highest <laughs> court in the land. Great topic. I'm so glad you brought me in for this. Uh, look. Uh, I am not concerned about Joe Biden winning, but the Senate map, as I'm sure Dr. Lauren Wright will tell you, is a very difficult one for Democrats. They're going to lose West Virginia. 
And then they've got a tough race in Ohio, a tough race in Montana, and several other difficult races around the country that they need to win to hold the United States Senate. And if they don't hold the United States Senate, the chances of getting judges confirmed become very iffy. But that said, I wish her a long life. I hope she stays on the court for another 20 years. Uh, she's a great New Yorker, and I'm very proud of her. Okay, Lauren, your response to that, do you feel like there are other motives when you look at the Senate races? Is that why? Well, gosh, I think you've stumbled on something that Chris and I might actually agree on, Liz. 69 is not 82. It's definitely not 87, which is what Justice Ginberg's was when she died. And, you know, just because someone is dealing with diabetes doesn't mean they can't manage it with probably the best health care that's available to anyone in the U.S. And, you know, it's not just the Senate map that's a really big risk here for Democrats should they go down this very, very ill-advised path. It's the Senate hearing of another proposed justice where Republicans get to ask on national television What's the definition of a woman? What's DEI? Should students be able to call for the genocide of Jews? These are all questions Democrats should not want to give Republicans an opportunity to answer, not even to mention the fact that Supreme Justices are not perfectly predictable. Gorsuch and Kavanaugh have sided with the liberal wing on some surprising issues that Trump was not happy about. And so you might get someone that's more moderate than Sotomayor or, or less predictable. But, you know, even if there were some type of a miracle, Chris, and we can talk, and you brought up the Senate, so I do want to bring up just simply the process of nominations. Let's just say in this hypothetical world, she retires tomorrow. It's not like nominations are done overnight. So I'm just wondering where this effort is coming from. I think people uh, on the left sometimes panic unnecessarily about all sorts of things. Uh, and this is no different than other panics that happen. Uh, there, there have been panics about Joe Biden. I don't know if they're as panicked today as they were two weeks ago. And I'm sure they'll panic again sometime over the summer. Uh, but I think that's probably where it comes from. Democrats have high anxiety. That said, if there's a need for a confirmation between now and the election, just like Donald Trump got it done with his majority in the Senate, the Democrats will get it done if the opportunity arises naturally or otherwise. OK, Lauren, we only have about 20 seconds. Your response to that? Well, I'll just make a very quick, unpopular pitch that gerontocracy is sometimes a better thing than we give it credit for. We need the experience of leaders that are older. <laughs> I agree, like Joe Biden. <laughs> All <laughs> right, you, well, Chris. I'm grateful for you both to be there. And on, on that note, we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining us on Balance. I will toss it to my friend, Chris Cuomo. <laughs>